Hello, everyone. Welcome to lecture two of our algebraic topology class. Today, we're going to learn a very general method for creating new spaces out of old spaces. And this captures the idea of gluing parts of a space to itself, or possibly gluing two spaces together along some subspaces. So what do I mean by this? Well, here is a topological space. It is homeomorphic to the interval. And what I can do is take one end of the space and glue it to the other end of the space. And if I do that, what I now get is something homeomorphic to the circle. So we're going to generalize this construction to uh, arbitrary dimensional spheres, and we're going to build something called CW complexes out of iterative constructions of this. So let's get to it. As I mentioned, quotient spaces capture the intuition of gluing two spaces together. So I want to put a topology on this, and roughly, I'll get into the formal definition soon, but open sets are sets that are open in all of the pieces before gluing. So for example, I can take the top half of this disk and glue it to this bottom half disk. And I can connect the whole boundaries together. And what I'll get is a sphere. And I need to decide how to topologize the sphere. So what I do is I look at a set, for example, this open patch here. And I look at the inverse image before I glued these things together. And those are both open sets in each of those disks. And so I consider this to be an open set. So let's get into the formal definition. Let x be a topological space. And let twiddle be an equivalence relation. On X. So let Y mod twiddle be the set of equivalence classes. of x under the relation twiddle. Then we topologize, oops, Let x mod twiddle, I'm going to call this y, be the set of equivalence classes of x under the relation twiddle. So we can topologize y. by specifying these sets, it's tau of y, so this just needs to be a collection of subsets of y, and we want them to be the ones consisting of x and x, so that the class of x is in u. 
And so this is a subset of X, and I want it to be open in X. So you can pause and, and think about exactly what this means. Uh, let's see an example of this. Let x be equal to this interval, 0 to 2 pi. And let twiddle be the relation. 0 is related to 2 pi and nothing else. Here's the claim. y, which is x mod 0 is related to 2 pi is homeomorphic to S1. Why should this make sense intuitively? Well, in the intro of the video, we saw the reason this is true. What I'm doing here is taking the unit interval and I'm gluing this bit to this bit. But let's, let's prove it. So, I'm actually just going to construct a homeomorphism between these two spaces, 0 to 2 pi and S1. So let f from 0 to 2 pi to S1 be given by f of theta is cosine theta sine theta. So here theta lives inside of 0 to 2 pi. So you may have a slight objection here. I'm trying to construct a homeomorphism, and that needs to be a bijection, first of all, right? But f of 0 is equal to f of 2 pi. That seems to be a problem. But remember, in this space, 0 is 2 pi. And so this map is honestly bijective. And it's also continuous. If I change the angle a little bit, the input angle, the output point on the circle only changes a little bit. But you should be cautious. The example I showed you last time was a continuous bijection, which happened to not have a continuous inverse. But this time, we do have a continuous inverse. So let g of x, or rather, let's let this take in theta from s1 to 0 to 2 pi be given by uh, so I'm going to take a point on the circle given by cosine theta, sine theta, and I'm going to output theta. And you can check now, this function actually is continuous. So I'm going to give a parallel exposition to what we just did. You can also define quotient spaces using an object called a quotient map. So the map pi from x to x mod twiddle given by, it's the natural map, x is sent to the equivalence class of x, is continuous. And it is called the quotient map. Here's a property that this map has. If u in uh, x mod twiddle is open, this is the same thing, because if and only if, 
pi inverse of u is open. So this is sort of the intrinsic definition. Now I want to give an extrinsic definition. So let pi from x to y, we don't know how they're related at first, be a surjective map such that if u and y is open, this is the same thing as uh, pi inverse of u being open. Then we call pi a quotient map. And here is the prototypical example you should keep in mind. So let pi from r n plus k to r n be given by pi of x one all the way up to x n plus k is sent to x one all the way up to x n. It just cuts off the last k factors. So, factorially, this just looks like all of these lines are collapsed down to a point, and you're just ending up with this line. And so this really is a quotient map. Like, if I look at the inverse image of this red set, for example, uh, which does not include the endpoints, then what I get is this open strip over here, which is an open set in R2 in this particular picture. Here is a theorem. It's called the characteristic property of quotient topologies. So let pi from x to y be a quotient map then for any topological space b a map f from y to b is continuous if and only if f composed with this uh, quotient map is continuous. So you could express this using a diagram. I have my space x here, pi goes down to y, and I have a map f going to b, and this map f is continuous if and only if uh, f composed with pi is continuous. Let's prove this. One direction is very easy. If f is continuous, then since the composition of continuous maps is continuous, and since pi is continuous, of course, uh, f composed with pi is continuous. The other direction is a little more interesting. Suppose 
f composed with pi is continuous. And let uh, u in b be an open set. So that means that f composed with pi inverse of u is open. So pi inverse of f inverse of u is open. But remember how the quotient map was defined. It says that the inverse image of a set is open if and only if the set itself is open. So f inverse of u is open. So what did we show? We started with an open set of b, and we showed f inverse of u is open. So f is continuous. Here's an important corollary. This is pretty important. It's called passing to the quotient. It exists in every field of math. And here's what it looks like in topology. Let pi from x to y be a quotient map. And let b be a topological space. Now let f from x to b be any continuous function so that if the projection map of P is equal to the projection map of Q. F of P is equal to F of Q. So here's the conclusion. Then there exists a unique continuous map from y to b, we'll call this f twiddle, so that f is equal to f twiddle composed with pi. So this follows pretty quickly from the other theorem. Let me give you a picture of what's going on here. So I have a space x, and maybe there's a subspace a here. Uh, and this space is mapped to another space, B. And maybe everything in A is sent by F all to this point, okay? And now I also have a projection to a space Y, which is given by like X mod A. So everything in A is crushed down to a point. Well, what this theorem is saying is that there exists a unique map, f twiddle, factoring these maps. Let's give an example. Let f from 0 to pi to r be given by f of x is equal to sine of x. Well, sine of 0 is equal to sine of 2 pi. So this is a map to r. Both the point 0 and 2 pi are sent to the same space. And so this needs to factor into the quotient of 0 to 2 pi 
by gluing 0 to 2 pi. So this factors to a map from the circle now to R. Uh, and it makes this diagram compute, commute. Uh, let's call this one f twiddle. So I have 0 to 2 pi, and I have this quotient, which we've seen before, to s1. This used to map by sine of x, and now s1 is also going to map to r by some unique map f twiddle. And you can see that this map is exactly given by projection of the circle onto the vertical axis. It's the height of the circle at a given point. So the next thing I want to do is generalize this construction to higher dimensional spaces and for weirder shapes than just the circle. And these spaces are called CW complexes. They're one of the most important spaces in algebraic topology. So remember, that dn is the subset of rn consisting of all points which are of distance less than or equal to 1 from the origin. And that sn minus 1 looks very similar. It's x1 to xn and these are in Rn, so that x1 squared plus all the way up to xn squared is equal to 1. So in particular, uh, like the boundary of dn is Sn. So here's a filled in ball. This is d3, and the boundary of d3 is this outside stuff here. And it's S2. And here's just a convention. D0 is a point. Let me first give you a prototypical example of what a CW complex looks like. So, uh, Here's a space. Uh, it looks like two loops, but one of them is filled in with a disk. We can construct this space by the following procedure. So what I do is I start with a point, and then I glue in two copies of the interval along their boundaries. So I take this entire interval and I put both endpoints at the same point. So what I get is now what I call the wedge of two circles. And the next thing I can do is glue in a disk by uh, mapping it to the right circle. And so what I'll get is this space here, the one I started with. So note that uh, this blue circle here is a D0. This is a D1, both of them. And this is a D2. So what I did is I built this space out of disks by gluing the disks to the previous spaces along their boundaries. And that's what a CW complex is. Let's give the formal definition.
building a CW complex. We build a CW complex via the following procedure. First of all, start with a discrete set. And we'll give this a name. We'll call it x0. So what this looks like is just a bunch of points, aka a bunch of d zeros. Next, I will form what I call the n skeleton xn from the n minus 1 skeleton, xn minus 1, inductively by attaching a copy of dn to xn minus 1 by a map phi from sn minus 1 to xn minus 1. What does this mean? Uh, anytime I'm talking about gluing things together, I'm talking about the quotient topology. Let me spell it out this time. That is, I form xn from the disjoint union, xn minus 1, disjoint union, dn, by the quotient under the equivalence relation uh, x is related to phi of x. So again, pictorially, uh, I had my space wedge of two circles, and I had my space, the disk, I took the disjoint union and then I modded it out by uh, a map phi, which sent the boundary of this circle, the boundary of the disk, to the right hand circle. Okay, so that's how I form xn. And finally, uh, I could stop this procedure at any time. So either stop at a finite amount of time, setting x is equal to xn for some n, or uh, continue forever. I don't have to stop this. I can build an infinite dimensional space this way. In this case, the topology gets a little hairier. And we give uh, x what's called the uh, weak topology. That's what the w in CW complex stands for. What is this topology? Uh, so I need to tell you what the open sets are. And all of the finite pieces are given the quotient topology. So we know what the open sets are there. Uh, and so A is open if and only if A intersect Xn is open for every N. Okay, let's make some auxiliary definitions here. If x is equal to xn for some finite n, 
and x is not equal to xn minus 1 for some for the same n, then we say x is n dimensional. <clears throat> and also, I, I said this a couple times before, but let me just write it down. Uh, xn is called the n skeleton. It's like the everything up to the n dimensional part. So this is everything less than or equal to n dimensional. Okay, and finally, a closed subset of X, which is also a CW complex, is called a subcomplex. And if A is a subcomplex, we call X together with A a CW pair. So, for example, all of the blue stuff in this picture. I'll call A, and all of the black and the blue stuff, all of this is X, and here XA is a CW pair. Okay, let's give some examples. We're going to give many examples here because this is an important class of spaces. Any graph is a CW complex. Uh, for example, uh, let me just draw a random graph. There's one with some loops. How do I build this? Well, I start with two zero cells, and then I glue on three one cells, sort of like building Ikea furniture or something. And the directions are, you take the two dots, you take the first line, and the attaching map is make it span both of those dots. And then you take the two remaining lines and attach both endpoints to either the left or the right uh, endpoint. The n-dimensional sphere is also a CW complex. And it is built using just two cells, a zero cell and an n cell. There's only one map from Sn minus one into a point, so I don't have to tell you what the attaching map is. Uh, let me just show you the examples. This will make sense. Uh, S1 is equal to a point union this line. Again, I only have one option for the attaching map. I attach both of the endpoints to the same point, and I get my friendly circle. The two sphere also is built using this fat in this fashion. I take a dot, and now I need to take a two disk.
And before I draw this, maybe you want to pause and try to visualize how this is going to give me my two sphere. So what I do is I take the whole disk and I crunch the boundary down to a point. And so it looks something like that. Crunch down to a point, which is, of course, equal to my usual sphere. And S3 is also built in this fashion. Now, S3 does not fit inside of three-dimensional space, so you can't see all of it at once. But this is a handy way for getting um, a handle on it. So I take a point, and I glue on a three-dimensional ball. All of this is filled in. And I can't draw it, but you can imagine moving around this space. You're basically moving around in the ball, and any time you get to the boundary, you can pop out at any other boundary point you want. If you'd like, you can draw a lower dimensional analogy by thinking of the two sphere as a disk. And then if you ever hit the boundary, you can come out wherever you want. OK, let's get into some more advanced examples. RPN. So recall that RPN is the space of lines in uh, Rn plus 1, which pass through the origin. So in two-dimensional space, uh, you know, this is a point. Each line in R2 becomes a point in RP1. So this is a point in RP1. And this is a point in RP1. And as you might imagine, lines with similar slopes are close to each other in RPN. So here's an observation. Observe that each line in Rn plus 1 hits Sn in two points. So here is S1, and this point, the red point in RP1, hits S1 in two places. And these points on the circle are antipodal. They're, they span a diameter, and they're on opposite ends. So these two points are antipodal. So RPN is actually homeomorphic to Sn mod the antipodal map. We usually write this as uh, x is related to minus x. So let's try to get a CW structure on RPN using this knowledge. And let me up the dimension so we we could see a little more of what's going on. So since each point in the upper hemisphere is identified with a point in the lower hemisphere, We can restrict ourselves to the upper hemisphere. So 
So now I have S2 and R3. And again, I can, I can throw out the, I'm, I'm trying to build RPN. And so I can throw out the lower hemisphere because every point down there is represented by a point in the top. The weird stuff is going to happen right around the equator. So in the equator, antipodal points are identified. Here, for example, is a line in R3, and it hits antipodal points on that green Sn minus 1. In other words, this green bit here, after I quotient, is going to be Rpn minus 1. So, after quotienting, this is r p n minus 1 okay so i'm building r p n here and what i see is i take a disk and i'm going to attach it to r p n minus 1 by some map of s1 and that map of s1 is the antipodal map so r p n is given by Rpn minus 1 together with an n disk, and this is quotiented by x goes to pi of x, where pi from Sn minus 1 to Rpn minus 1 is the quotient map that comes from this antipodal map. Great. Uh, so, in fact, this gives us a way to build RPN from the ground up. So, in general, RPN is equal to D0 union, D1 union, all the way up to Dn, where uh, Di is attached to uh, x n minus 1. And the, the n minus 1 skeleton of this object is going to be r p n minus 1 by the quotient map of the antipodal map. So that one was a bit of a doozy. But if you understood that example, you understand how to build CW complexes. So here's a note. Since the space is built in a very predefined fashion at every single level, we can continue this process infinitely. RP infinity is obtained by continuing this process infinitely. And this space is actually very important for various applications in a field of algebraic topology called homotopy theory. OK, so let's do a similar example, but I'm going to give much less details this time. So CPN. So CPN is the space of complex lines in C n plus 1. Uh, it can be viewed so just as lines in real space pass between two points, 
So do lines in complex uh, two points on the uh, n minus one sphere. A similar thing happens here. We can view this as s two n plus one modulo v is identified with lambda v for lambda a complex number with the modulus of lambda equal to one. So don't get thrown off the, by the dimensions here. Remember that two complex dimensions is one real dimension. So S 2N plus one really does sit inside of C N plus one. Uh, so a similar analysis to before. shows that CPN can be built by uh, D0 union D2 union D4 all the way up to Dn minus 2. And then finally, a Dn on top, where D n is attached to the n minus 1 skeleton, which is the same thing as the n minus 2 skeleton here, by quotient map uh, s n minus 1 to cp n minus 2. OK, and a similar thing exists here, where there's a space at this infinite limit called CP infinity. So the next thing I want to talk about is a, another way to build a space out of two input spaces, and it's called the product topology. So intuitively, the product of x and y topological spaces is a space which has a copy of y at each point in x. So for example, if I take r cross r, what I do is I start with the real line. And then at each point of the real line, I put another real line. So you should be able to recognize this space. It's homeomorphic to r2. How do we define this? Okay, so let X and Y be topological spaces. The product space, X cross Y, is given as a set by the Cartesian product. of x and y. And now I need to tell you what sets are open. That's a little annoying, but what I can do is give you a basis. A basis for the topology is uh, b is u cross v, where u subset of x is open and v, a subset of y, is open. So, for example, in the, uh, in the case of R2, here is an element of the basis. Uh, here is an open set inside of one copy of R. Here's another open set in the other copy of R. 
And I'm telling you that this is a basis. So the basis in R2 is open rectangles. Let's do another example. Uh, what is S1 cross S1? So I encourage you to pause the video here and think about it visually. You have a circle, and at each point of the circle, you want to put another circle. So what does that look like? So you take a circle, and at each point, put a little circle here and interpolate. And what you get is the torus from before. Here's an exercise. Show that the product of CW complexes is itself a CW complex. Oops. That's a little tricky. Here's something you should definitely do, at least. Think about what the dimension should be. So uh, from now on, all of the maps I'm going to talk about, I'm going to assume to be continuous. The next thing I want to do is tell you some equivalence relation between maps, continuous maps, on a topological space. And it's called homotopy. Here's a definition. So let G and H be maps between X and Y. We say G and H are homotopic if there exists a family of maps Ft from x to y so that uh, this t here is between 0 and 1. First of all, f0 is the map g. Second of all, F1 is the map H, so that's the between G and H part. And finally, the map capital F from X cross I into Y given by f of x t is lowercase f t of x is continuous. So I know a topology on x and I know a topology on y. The topology on x gives me a topology on x cross i. i is the unit interval, topologized in the normal way. And we want this to be continuous as we move in the i direction. So what does that look like pictorially? Well, there's two ways to look at it. One is, uh, okay, let's like 
let x be a circle and y be the plane, then uh, the map looks like a homotopy. You could imagine it as like evolving through time. So, for example, out here is a map from the circle into the plane. I call this F0. And then maybe it morphs a little bit inwards. We'll call this F1 half. And then finally, it just gets really small and maybe very wrinkly. And this is F1. But the point is that it's moving kind of smoothly. It's not jumping around very uh, erratically. There's another way to look at it. I could look at like X cross I. Here it's a circle. And then at every point on the circle, I put a line. So that's a cylinder. And Y was, let's just let it be the plane again. And I can look at a homotopy as a map of x cross i into y, which is continuous. For example, here would be f0. And then here is f1. And all of this stuff here is the image of x cross i, the continuous image of x cross i. Just some notation if F is homotopic to G, we write F line twiddle G. So let's see an example of this. So uh, let uh, H from S1 to R2 be given by, well, it's the usual map of S1 into R2. I take an angle theta and I map it to cosine theta, sine theta. And let G from S1 to R2 be H of, oh, sorry, G of theta is just the point zero, zero. So the image of H is a circle, and the image of G is just this point in the middle. I claim that these are homotopic. So let f of t of theta, so this is a homotopy, S1, be f t of theta is equal to 1 minus t of cosine theta and 1 minus t of sine of theta. So notice that f0 of theta is equal to h, and f1 of theta is equal to g. So, uh, and, and moreover, this is continuous. As t changes a tiny little bit, the map changes only a tiny little bit. So FT is a continuous family. So H and G are homotopic. Here's a little definition, which uh, comes from this exact situation. If a map F is homotopic, to a constant map, we say F is null homotopic.
So what we learned here is that this map from S1 into R2 is null homotopic. And I, I just want to show you what that means visually. Uh, it's a map from S1 cross I into the plane and the image, it started as the unit circle and it encompasses basically this whole disk. It shrinks down to the point, sweeping everything out. And so the image of this thing is a disk. Okay, so that's gonna do it for today. What I want you to take away from this class mostly is CW complexes, how to build them, what they look like. And uh, if you wanna practice, you should try building some CW complexes of your own. And the other thing I want you to take away is homotopy of maps. You should just pick two spaces and imagine a homotopy of a map between them. Just It's like moving one space around inside the other continuously. Thanks, and I'll see you again next time.